This is part two of the 2020 uh, trial, and what we're going to look at is from the... We've looked at the first two questions of part one, um, or, or, or question 21, so we're now at uh, question 21, part C. And so this is a E equals flea question. So what we're looking at is a stress-strain diagram. And the thing that we want to remember is that the Young's modulus only applies up until the elastic limit. Or actually, specifically, Young's modulus only applies up to the proportional limit. The elastic limit and the proportional limit are not always the same, but for your HSA, you can pretty much treat them as the same thing. So where this stops being a, stop, a straight line, Young's modulus is no longer a proportional uh, effect, right? It's no longer linear. So it's only up to that proportional limit that Young's modulus applies. Some people took the value based on this point, the UTS, and that is wrong. Right, you cannot determine the Young's modulus if you took took it. Oh, um, if people want to get their exams, they can. Should have done that before I started recording, but anyway, better late than never. So, let's see what is our formula. So we're writing E equals flea, and what are the values? So, F equals I use twenty. Now, a lot of people use twenty-five, right? And I understand why they would. But why would you use 25 when you can just use this nice, easy 20 divided by 1? Yeah, it's just, you don't even need, like, you don't, just whatever is, makes for good maths. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. But cheers, thank you. You know what? We're just going to So for those of you who listen to that recording, if I don't edit this out, the microphone just fell off the stand. So sorry about that. Okay. So the force is 20,000 newtons. Remember, we can. a lot of people didn't use grease units here. Yeah, remember we're allowed to use megapascals and millimeters squared. So, um, or millimeters. So the answer, we always use newtons though. So we want 20,000 times L. L is 200 millimeters. So we can just try 20,000 times, yep. Yeah. Yes, if all of our, our, all of your stresses have to be megapascals, though. That's why we have the song. Yes, that's right. It, anything with millimeters, we can use megapascals and millimeters, any combination of millimeters, right, which is why we have our song. The reason why I, I specify millimeters squared in the song is just because it rhymes better, or it fits the, the, the beats better. The fact is, when we use um, bending moment stre bending stress, right, we're going to use millimeters to the power of four. So yes, we, we're allowed to use millimeters and megapascals. Okay, so 20,000 times 200 divided by, I used one millimeter, times now the area I think was 6.25 what the, how I got that is it's if the diameter is five millimeters if we're going to use um, pi r squared which I hate but we're going to use that that's 2.5 times two uh, sorry 2.5 squared is 6.25 no it's not it's not five millimeters what is that number 2.5 times 2.5 5 times 3.14 equals 19. I don't know. It, um, it must be 6.25 times pi. Anyway, 19. So when we write that up on the board, we can see that effectively we have 20,000 times 200 divided by something pretty close to 20. Right? We're going to get an answer of 200 and, um, is it 203,000. Now it's 203,000 megapascals, right? Because we go together like megapascals and millimeters squared, right? So it's um, 203,000 megapascals, which is the same as 203 gigapascals. Now I played with these numbers a little bit to make sure that the number was something close to the values we see for steel. What is the value for steel? Does anyone know? Okay, so this the yield strength for steel is about 300 megapascals. Yeah, the yield strength is about 300 megapascals. The Young's modulus is about 210 gigapascals. Now, 
just be mindful right that just because that's a familiar value and i deliberately wanted to give it a familiar value i wanted a value so that when you saw that answer like oh this sounds about right just remember that although this is clearly what what is what material is this based on the stress strain diagram there's only one that we need to recognize and it is it 0.3 percent carbon steel yeah mild steel right mild steel looks like that you should all be able to recognize mild steel but just because it looks like it's familiar, that doesn't mean that the alloy, the particular alloy that we're using has that Young's modulus. So if you get a value that say 100, right, that's not unreasonable that the material we're using could be a less stiff material. Yep. Would you be able to recognize the, the, the shape that makes the distinct or is it the, the value? The shape. The, the, the shape is what makes it distinct. 0.3 is, is distinctly that. The 0.3 is this point here where I have my cursor. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. 0 0.3 is the shape. The 300 megapascals is the value where, where I have my cursor. That's what we should expect for... Well, let's just to prove me right, right? Like, let's go in mild right. steel. Other, other steels would be different to that, where you can go. Um, okay, so that's a stress-strain curve for, for mild steel, right? So they're... they're like when we look at our we, we've tested this right with um so if we look this is the true strength right there's some variation but there's always that bit of a bump right yeah we can see that they're all pretty similar like that one there i'd say looks more different than a lot of the others but even that that's all still mild steel right whereas if we have a look at say aluminium It doesn't have the, what the, the key thing that we're looking for. The, so that's the difference between steel and aluminium. The difference, as well, is that it doesn't have any of the stress hardening range, right? Because it doesn't have a definite yield point. Aluminium, if we look at brass, right? Again, brass doesn't have a definite yield point. How do we find the value if we don't have a definite yield point? We have to use, starts with P. progressive right progressive yield we use the proof stress yeah kitty from progressive she wants to see the proof right okay so um yeah look generally speaking you should be able to recognize that diagram as being mild steel this value for mild steel is about 300 megapascals okay so that's the answer there okay question 22 we're into some wordy questions these are much better for videos explain why engineers refer to shear force diagrams and bending moment diagrams when determining effects of the load on beam okay so the real the this is a four mark question right and i think that this is actually quite hard for four marks in that pushing for th three marks is pretty easy pushing for the fourth mark i think is quite difficult um so the first mark is if you say engineers look at diagrams so things don't fall down yeah or engineers use these diagrams to make them strong something like that right something that is a rudimentary like what a year six kid could figure out now for two marks if you say engineers use these diagrams to determine the maximum maximum stresses right maximum bending stress the maximum whatever stress right maximum shear stress that's two marks right for three marks, we need to explain. We need to have cause and effect. We need to have how and why. Why do they use these diagrams? Yes, they use them to find the maximum minimum, but what is the effect of finding the maximum minimum? What do we go from there? What do we do once we know what, what the, the maximum stress is? Okay, we, should, we, we decide how much reinforcement we're going to add to the concrete. And specifically, I've talked about this in a fair bit of detail with you guys, we don't put the same amount of reinforcement through the entire structure. We put we increase the reinforcement where it needs more. And we can have less reinforcement where it needs less. Right? Another thing we can do is we can change the properties of the beam. We can make it deeper. We can change the supports. Right? Now, another thing you could write is you could just talk about in terms of factors of safety, determine how many factors of safety. That was a, something when my experience where if, if you're looking for fourth mark if someone's talked about safety as an additional consideration that's something where i can i can look at trying to squeeze an extra mark okay 
evaluate the use as tim of timber as a structural material for trusses. I think this was generally answered pretty well. Okay, so I've mentioned, uh, first I want to point out that it says the word evaluate. Now we have evaluate written up on the board, on the wall there, right? And it says make a judgment. The very first thing there is we need to make a judgment based on criteria and determine the value of, right? Okay, so what is the criteria that makes timber a good or bad material? Well, so what a lot of people have said is, they either said timber is a good material for trusses or a bad material for trusses. I don't care which one you made, you just you need to make a judgment. And then so people would say some of the things that are good about timber is it's uh, plentiful rather than cheap. Say it's a renewable resource that's readily available. It can be cut. It can be joined easily. It has a good strength to weight ratio. What's bad about it? Well, it rots, it decomposes, it, um, it burns, right? So... And it's not as strong as newer materials like steel and concrete. Yet, as long as you can put in any combination of those three things, you're okay. Right? I need a judgment. I don't care if you say timber's good or timber is bad. I honestly don't care. You, 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 just as long as you can support it with it's bad because it burns and there's stronger materials, that's fine. If you said it's good because it's plentiful and although it's not very strong, it's still, it still has been used in the past. Right? Pretty. I think that most people answer that pretty well. Outline an example of how engineers must behave ethically um, in the design or construction of structures. Okay, so for starters, you've got to read the whole question, right? So it says specifically with structures. So that's the first consideration. That said, I, when I was marking, I might not have always taken that into account, but, you know, it should really be a question. Your answer, if you said, um, for instance, that companies killed the electric car because oil companies wanted to make money, well, that's not really... Hello! I am recording, but give me one second. Okay, um, to come back, we're talking about the ethics. So generally, you just try and read the question, make sure that the, the answer you give is applicable to the question that's actually written. That said, um, okay, what are we looking at here as some examples? Well, the two main areas I would look at where we want to think about corruption in terms of um, design is I would think about things like environmental protection and just embezzlement, right, fraud. Or um, we can look at a variation of that, which is um, signing off things that you know are not safe. So, for instance, if I was writing this, because, you know, I live in a building with lots of cracks and, you know, it gave me a lot of anxiety for a long time, I would say that engineers must ensure that the work they sign off is actually what has been been designed and that they don't cut corners in their design process. Make sure that they follow the AS1100. Uh, sorry, not the AS1100. That's a drawing standard. That's the least important standard probably in terms of this. Uh, make sure that they follow the appropriate standard uh, for design. Make sure that they don't sign off work that they haven't um, observed themselves. Make sure that work is built to the uh, the appropriate quality. That would probably be the main thing I would focus on in terms of that. I'd also say things like in terms of fraud, making sure that um, engineers seek the, the best price uh, for goods and that they don't receive payment for referring contractors, right? That's a really important thing, right? So that when we have corruption watchdogs, one of the things they really worry about is people who, I, I've talked about this before, but I'll go through it very quickly. Let's say I want to order a whole bunch of concrete to build a bridge. And my brother Jimmy, he uh, is a concrete supplier. So I call up Jimmy and I say, hey, Jimmy, um, I want you to charge us double and you and I, we can split the profit, right? That's a, that's a pretty common thing. And so that's why we have what was called probity commissions where, you know, probity teams to make sure that we get three prices and that they're legitimate prices and to make sure that you announce if you have any connection to the people. The problem is that these are things that really do happen. We see ministers, we see... Um, uh, transport officials, it's actually far more often politicians than these engineers, who they will build a, a, a new road network and that they all own all the land that they've ch chosen randomly to uh, for the place where the road is going to go through. So suddenly the, the road value just triples or increases by 10 times or something like that because now there's going to be a new road and it's going to be you know, a much more valuable property. Uh, that's actually a theme if anyone ever watches the TV show Boardwalk Empire, the first season is a big theme. Um, the other one is environmental protection, making sure that we don't we don't cut any corners in terms of environmental protection, make sure that we follow all due steps to preserve 
um, preserve natural environments to make sure that we don't damage waterways and also to ensure that we follow the rules in terms of like construction requirements and sort of stuff like in terms of noise anyway that's a really long answer for probably boring okay moving on got some materials we've got this vehicle here a people move a, a people move a vehicle is assembled using a variety of parts okay so what do we, what do we think the tires are going to be made out of Rob, I, I gave that correct, but can anyone give me um, a better answer? Vulcanized. vulcanized rubber is an even better answer. Okay, so vulcanized rubber is made is chosen because it has flexibility, high coefficient of friction. That's true. It's made through compression molding. That's true. Okay, axles. They're made of alloy steel. What would be a property that we want them for? Toughness. Yeah, I'm, I, I quite like the answer toughness. So axles are exposed to shock. Right when you go into a pothole, boom! You know you don't want the, the axle to shear, or when you mount the curb, which is you know something that I've experienced a little bit in my recent driving lessons, um, that you don't want to have that sudden shock of going up on the curb to shear your axle. So you want to have a bit of toughness. Okay, acrylic. So acrylic is chosen for its excellent transparency. Um, polycarbonate has a, even better transparency, but acrylic has pretty good transparency. What? manufacturing process would we use injection molding is the answer i really want um now if in doubt assuming it's not a multiple choice question injection molding is a pretty great answer it's almost always an unacceptable answer for plastic now there might be better methods but injection molding is almost always a suitable method now the thing is you might get a multiple choice question that doesn't offer injection molding as an option and that's when you've got to like you know scratch your head and really think about it right is this blow molding is this vacuum molding is this rotational molding these sorts of things but in this case if you've got a blank space and you write injection molding i think it's pretty hard for that to be given as incorrect um now some people wrote some other things i was pretty flexible with options but if you say casting casting is never right casting is for metals right molding is for plastics okay chassis is made out of mild steel how would you make a, a chassis? Um, yeah, look, I'm okay with the idea that the sheets are, are rolled at some point. Yeah, uh, so I'd probably try to give that a mark. Oh, they said rolled. Ha! Huh, great. I would have said forged, but okay, there we go. Great, great, great pointing out. I, I love that I'm recorded on this. Um, Okay, it's funny because I'm like, I don't remember seeing a lot of people write rolled, and that would be the reason why. Okay, so I'm going to explain this, try and dig myself out of this hole. So sheet steel would be rolled, but the actual shape, the final the final production process, I would say be forged, right? So we'd be going into a, a big shape that would press it out, and, and uh, each of those pieces would be forged. Um but the engineering property that's what we're supposed to be filling in what is the property that we want for something that's going to be uh used as a chassis okay strong absolutely good answer right um i think a lot of people wrote hard and i'm like i had to scratch my head i'm like well i guess hard i mean you're gonna have rocks and things fly up against this chassis so we want to make sure that it doesn't you know wear away but hardness isn't really what i want strength strength is important i'd probably say that's the best answer but also plasticity, right? The fact is that it's going to be formed into a shape. It's going to be forged. So the idea that it can be easily shaped is important. Um, but really, that's kind of a bit of a freebie. I don't think I gave many people a wrong answer on that one. Okay, material for... Okay, so we need a material that has resilience and a material that has um, hand layer. What might that be? What material is made with hand layer? Okay, so this here, this great picture, is the one that I choose to be my carbon fiber reinforced polymer. Now, how do we make it? We can use hand layup, we can use resin infusion and pre-preg pre -preg, uh, envelopes where we put together, the, put together all the ingredients, we put them in a plastic bag, we vacuum form it, 
and then we put it into to cure in an autoclave. If you would like to learn more about that, just like Starship Troopers, click on this video, and I have timestamped at the five minute mark where we start seeing. And can you see how on the side it says all of the steps? Now, okay. So we've shown that before. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Here I have this. Look at this amazing piece and that amazing music, where they're showing how we're vacuum forming. We're vacuum forming the carbon fiber into the shape of a. I think this is a motorcycle part. Look at how shiny that comes up. So it is indeed a motorcycle part. Now, oh. A ninja for a Kawasaki ninja. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, so the point here there is another material that can also be made in the same process. It's not carbon fiber reinforced polymer, it is glass fiber reinforced polymer, right? We have CFRP and GFRP, yeah? Fiberglass. Fiberglass can also be made in this same process. Okay? So, now, electrical wire. So, we use copper. Why do we use copper? Because it has excellent conductivity. It doesn't have the best conductivity. Silver and gold have better conductivity, but copper is pretty damn good. Aluminium is not so great, but it has its place. Where do we use aluminium as a conductor? Yep. Yeah, like the transmission lines that go to your house. Okay. Because of the weight. Is important um, and cost. Now, now, what is the method that we use to produce copper wire? Okay, an answer a lot of people gave is extrusion, right? But there's a better answer than extrusion. How do you how do you make wire? Drawing, excellent, right? Drawing. So if we go back to our manufacturing processes, yeah, guys, if we go back to our manufacturing processes, right, in forming, the four main forming processes, we have forging, rolling, drawing, which is used for rods, wire, and tubing, and we have extrusion, which is used for rods and tubing. Can you see how wire is drawn? Now, if you were had a very, very, very lenient teacher, you might have still got a mark for uh, extrusion. But if that was the case, you'd be counting your lucky stars, right? And um, you'd be taking that mark and running with it all the way to the bank and making sure that by the time you got to the HSC that you knew better, right? Message received. Okay, so a valve connection um, is produced by powder forming. Describe the method. Uh, um, describe this method of manufacturing and state one advantage of this method. Okay, what is the example that we always talk about that we use um, sintered metals or powder forming metals for? Yeah, Happy Meal toys, Macca's toys, right? Um, now I'm actually going to get the textbook. Bear with me, people who are following along. Hmm. Hopefully Copeland never watches this video to see that I've got a PDF of his textbook. But um Okay. Where do we talk about powder forming? We talk about powder forming on page one, two, three of the book. Okay, step one. We take powder particles in a free state. Step two, we cold weld them with pressing. Step three, we sinter them in under heat. Right? And so all of these little metal molecules, when we cold weld, we, we've, we've talked about cold welding before. Theoretically, if you have a vacuum, you can take an aluminium pipe or an aluminium rod, you can polish it smooth, stick them together, and as long as you're in a vacuum, they will fuse, they'll cold weld. Right? Now, the reason we can't do that normally is because the oxygen gets to the material and it corrodes the ends so that they won't join. Right? We can't just take two pieces of metal and join them. But in a vacuum, in space, we can do that. 
That's what we're doing here, but we're doing it at a very, very tiny level, right? So we're cold, cold welding here. We're joining the edge, and then we sinter, which heats them up to join them. Um, I might make a note of that for later, but for now, you know, a print screen. I'll stick it on the Facebook, and that will remind me to clean it up and do a better job later. Cold welding. That's the worst remind. I mean, like as an individual, it's fine as a reminder to not not great set of notes. Okay, back to the book. The mild steel chassis in a vehicle has been normalized. Describe the process and resulting grain structure, including a label diagram. You need to label diagrams. Diagrams are usually worth microstructure diagrams. Are usually worth two marks, right? You do not get two marks without labeling, right? That's important. Okay, so. I'm just trying to think how I can do this without drawing on the board. Okay, what is the process of normalizing? Well, uh, we should probably be familiar with our heat treatment processes. Um, where's our mate Neil? And here's our normalizing one. Okay, step one heat to 100% uh, gamma steel, right? Heat to 100% austenite, heat to red hot. I think that's actually the, the fewest words you can write. Heat to red hot, right? In the case of normalizing, you have to heat till about 900 degrees, but you don't need to worry about that. If you just write heat to 100% gamma, right? Or heat to entirely re, um, recrystallized. Got a few options. You choose one. Then cool in still air, right? Cool slowly in air. Um, and then the result is, uh, it's actually just cool in still air. You'd say cool slowly if we were talking about furnace. Just say cool in, cool in still air. Which I think is what most people said. Okay, what is our result? Harder, stronger, small equiex grains, some stress. Now, I can't just say use this diagram. Why can't I use this diagram? Because I specified that it's a mild steel chassis. So if it's mild steel, that means we have to draw we have to draw out our crystals, including perlite and ferrite. Um, Oh yeah, this will do. Uh, it's a little bit too zoomed in. It's a little bit too low carbon. Eh, this is low carbon. There we go. I like this. This looks like more like not. Um, okay. So we've got small equiex grains, and we've got some chunks of perlite. Right, so I think I saw some people mislabel the uh, the grains, which is not ideal. So here's a question for you. This came up with year eleven. I think it's a pretty good question. Here's how I draw it. I always seem to draw that same shape. There you go. That's my section, and then I just draw off that alpha. That's the easiest way to write ferrite. Can't spell that wrong. And then I write perlite. Now, here's a quick question for you. How much cementite is in this diagram? None? Some of the perlite. Yeah? So the perlite is layers of alpha plus FeC3. So, assuming that at point three we're at about uh, we're at about thirty let's say thirty percent um, perlite. Let's say the perlite is fifty fifty. We're saying maybe we're at about fifteen percent cementite in this diagram. I thought it was a really great question. So I my year eleven sort of caught me out on that. I, I was impressed. Okay, back to the back to the notes. Okay, I got a bridge. It's worth four marks. What do we write? Look, I was talking to my design class this morning, and I was saying, if you see four marks and you see two things, try and think about it in terms of split it into two halves and split those two halves into two parts. Right. So what I'm looking for here, remember the keyword here is explain. So we want cause and effect. 
right? We want how and why, right? So what I want to say for explain is, okay, stone bridges were used in the 15th century. Why? Because arches are strong in compression and because it's durable. They didn't burn, yeah? If you wrote either of those two, I'm happy to give you two marks for that. Okay, I don't think I saw a single person use the word um, cable stay bridge, right? Luckily, I was feeling very lenient when I was marking that. Right, so the second bridge in the 21st century, I'm pretty sure that is the um, Millau Viaduct. Um, so cable stay bridges use advanced materials and techniques, including, including um, in, did you write cable stay? Okay. Um, in, in advanced Advanced materials and techniques, including uh, reinforced steel, which is uh, steel is, uh, that provides strength and tension. Concrete provides uh, good compressive strength. Um, if you wanted to talk about, say, like, you know, it uses advanced um, design, like finite element analysis and that sort of stuff, you could. But I was pretty generous on that second mark, right? So that's for those four marks. Describe the two areas of engineering that have had significant impact during pandemics. Okay, now I don't want to criticize on a video that I'm putting on the internet um, anyone specifically, but that's not a good start way to start any sentence, is it really? Um, I'm just going to start a whole new sentence. I was looking at someone else's paper and they had eight marks and then another four marks dedicated to COVID. And yes, I appreciate it's a big deal at the moment, but no mark in the HSC should, no question the HSC is likely to be worth more than six marks, right? Six marks is the big question in the HSC. So six marks is usually dedicated to a drawing. And you know, like it could be six marks. We have seen six marks for a trust now that happened last year. We can have six marks for um, worded questions, absolutely, but anything more than that is, is a bit unlikely to be the case, right? And to have the same question effectively twice, I'm like, well, not ideal. Um, that's not my only criticism, but we'll worry about that later. Um, okay. Describe two areas of engineering that have had significant input during pandemics. Okay. Again, four marks. I just divide it two and two. So what most people went with was um, aeronautical and telecommunications, probably because they're the two subjects we uh, we study. Uh, the other one that was common is uh, biomedical, also an area that we study. Okay, I'm happy with all three of those answers. Um, so if it's aeronautical, you say, well, aeronautical engineering has been the big vector for this virus, right? People flying around the world has been what spread the virus. But we could also say that because of you know travel restrictions, there's now a lot of bans that's really hurt the aviation industry. It's not really an impact, that's more an, um, a, an effect rather than impact, yeah? It does, I, 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 so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. saying. I'm giving you that, but other people might, might not. That is the point I'm saying here. If you want, so impact, you could say that there's been a negative impact of planes have spread the disease. You could say there's been an effect, uh, loss of jobs because of um, canceled flights. The question is, is no, so okay, I'm telling you, input is the is what the question says, and that's the better thing to write. I'm saying I did give some people marks for writing effects rather than inputs, right? Because I was being generous. And again, if you got one of those marks, you you know, be happy with yourself and make sure that you know better for the the final exam. But um, inputs also could include things like um, medical response. For instance, flying doctors. There's various things you, you, if you want to go with aviation. Okay, a better one that doesn't mix up those inputs and effects um, and is more straightforward is if you talked about telecommunication, right? A lot of people are working from home. They're Zooming. You know, they're able to talk to friends and family who live overseas. They're able to have medical appointments through telehealth, those sorts of things. That's an easy one. Um, biomedical. Now, biomedical was a bit tough, right? So when people, a lot of people said biomedical engineers uh, finding cures. And I don't like that as a goal, right? Because generally finding cures, that, that would be immunologists or pharmacologists. That's not really biomedical engineers. If you, on the other hand, said 
bi um, biomedical engineers are helping to develop testing equipment, right, and the, the infrastructure to help doctors to, to uh, test and treat patients, then that's A-OK. -okay. That's beautiful. Um, the last one that I wanted to mention is I think one student mentioned civil engineering and they talked about how China had pop-up hospitals. And I'm like, well done. That's really good. No one else said that. And I was really impressed. I, I liked that answer. Okay, so that's how I would approach that. Describe one example of the environmental impact of a form of public or private transport. Now, I feel as though this is just two gift marks. If you couldn't get two marks for this, um, you know, I don't think you were probably applying yourself as much as you could have. So there's just so many options here. Effectively, just pick one. Uh, cars, I mean, some people mention bikes, but uh, cars, planes, they run on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are non-renewable resources. They produce greenhouse gases. I don't think I need to say any more than that. I think pe people answer this question pretty well. Okay. We've got a question here on um, efficiency and mechanical advantage. Now, this question was completely unmodified from one of the study questions that I put on your book. If we go to albums. Okay. Here's the question here. Now, it says, what is the velocity ratio of this question? Okay. When we do velocity ratio, there is a formula, right? Well, what is the form? Let's start with what is the formula for a velocity ratio? Okay, now I'll be honest, I don't remember that formula. What I remember is MA equals L over E. And then remember, velocity ratio is those two letters swap around. So it must be then DE over DL, right? Which I think is what you all said. Okay, DL over, DE over DL. Now, what, which one's the F and which one's the load? Yeah, the effort is where the human or the machine puts in the effort, puts in, puts in work, right? So it's at the pedal or it's where, where it connects to the human or it connects to the motor. Yeah? Whoever's doing the work is the effort. The load is the other part, right? The thing that's being lifted or moved, right? So in this case, what's being moved is the wheel, right? Okay. So what we want is what is the distance of the effort? Now, what we're finding here is what is the circumference of the wheel and how many times is it turning around? Now, the thing is, circumference is equal to radius times uh, radius times pi. So if we know that both of these numbers are going to be multiplied by pi, we can just use the radio the ratio of radiuses or the ratio of diameters, whichever one we want. And that's what I recommend you do. You don't need the pi because the pi is both on the denominator and the numerator just cancels out. So what we get here is effectively we can take what we call little d over big D times n rev. Now in this case, little d is our effort. It's seven feet, uh, I'm sorry, one seven, 170, but that's the radius, and we're comparing it to a diameter of 700. So what do we need to do? We either need to halve the 700 or we need to double the 170. I think most people double the 170, right? We go to, to um, diameter. So at the top of our, our, our numerator, the thing on the top is going to be 340, and it's going to be divided by 750. But the thing is, this pedal in the time that it takes to move around once, the big wheel will have turned around how many times? Well, two and a half, exactly right, because there's 50 teeth on the pedal and there's two, 20 teeth on the wheel. What that means is that every for every tooth that this one moves, this one's going to move two and a half, right? It's going to move two and a half times, right? It takes longer for this one to turn around because it's got more teeth, right? So... We just divide this number, 50 divided by 2, 50 gives us 2 and a, 50 divided by 20 gives us 2.5. So it means the big wheel is going to go around two and a half times. So it's going to be 340 divided by brackets, 700 times 2.5, close brackets. And the answer for that, I'm pretty sure, is um, 1.9, just from memory. Now, oh, it's 1.943. There we go. 
I recommend you give four decimal places. This is the only time I say four decimal places is when you're doing efficiency questions. Right? Efficiency, we want to go to four decimal places. Now, what is mechanical advantage? Well, it's just using what we know about load and effort. Our load is 70, our effort is 450, so it gives us a mechanical advantage of 0 0.5, oh, sorry, 0 0.155. And then, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the mechanical advantage over the velocity, which gives us 80%. All right. Like we said, bikes are one of the most efficient machines around, right? Regularly over 80%. So um, just keep that in mind, right? Bikes are very efficient machines. Okay. Uh, pretty much I gave you one mark for each part of that. That was three marks. Uh, most people answered that either they got it all right or they didn't attempt it. It's pretty much the case. I think there were some people who made like a silly mistake and they had carried errors. And there were a few people who just, yeah, they, they, there were some people who got one mark because they at least showed that they knew that efficiency equals velocity, a mechanical advantage over velocity ratio. So they got that MA over VR. Okay, this question, I don't want to say it's a gift of two marks, but it's pretty easy. As long That said, a lot of kids got this wrong. Right, so the formula that we want to use here, let's go to the formula sheet really quickly. Right, we're just trying to remember roughly where we're at page 25. Okay, if we look at a formula sheet, our formula sheet does it include fight the power, fight the power FE? It does not. Okay, the formula for power is work over time, and work because we know work equals FS, what's S over T equal to? S divided by T. What's that another? What's another word for displacement over time? Velocity. So what we know is that power equals force times velocity. Which our mate Flavor Flav, if we go to our album, right? He likes to say, "Fight the power, fight the power." F V, right? F V for Flavor Flav. Anyway, um, so. What did we need to do in this this page then? Well, go okay, to page twenty-five. Okay. What we know is P of three hundred thousand equals F, which is unknown, multiplied by what is the velocity? Twelve kilometers per hour divided by three point six. The fact that some of you, I'll be honest, when I was in high school, I didn't remember that you just divide by 3.6. I worked it out by, from, from scratch every time. I would multiply by a thousand to get, turn kilo, kilometers into meters, and then I divide by 60 seconds, divide by 60 minutes, and I'd get my answer. It just gets to a point where Ed Sheeran has taught me that you just divide by 3.6, right? And I've just, I've learned that and you just do it. And so that gives us an answer of 3.3. So F, if P equals FV, that means that F equals P divided by V. That's right. Okay. Okay, so that should be equal, what is it, 300,000 divided by 3.3 repeater. What answer do we get? One, two, three thousand divided by 3.333 equals, okay, I was worried for a second that I'd done the wrong maths. 90,000. Now, it says 90,000, remember we want to have our answer in Newtons, right? Now just check that you don't write kilonewtons or newtons, right? So it tells you there to give the answer in newtons, so it's 90,000 newtons. Okay. A vehicle with a total mass of um, 1,200 kilograms and is stopped on a 20-degree 20, 20 incline. The coefficient of friction is between the tires, between the tires on the road is 0.25. Determine the force that the engine must provide in order to move up the incline. Okay, so this is a too many guys formula, right? So that, that formula is T equals mg 
brackets sine cos plus or minus mu cos theta. Now, um, I mean, I've talked to you before about how to remember that story. So I was going to a party on a boat and there were too many guys. And I said, okay, that's how I'm leaving. I won't go to leave. I hit my head on the sign. And then to top it off, right, some guy sneezes on me, right? You got mucus all over me, right? That's the story to help you remember. Now, which part is which? Well, the sine theta, that's just the weight the weight of the object trying to go down the hill, right? The cos the, the, the mucus, that's the friction force. Now, the question we have to say is, is friction helping or hurting us? Now, I could to say, when I first started teaching at high school, where I hadn't done a lot of friction questions in the last decade prior to that, um, that I really had, to, I, I couldn't understand where it was, sometimes it was plus and sometimes it was minus. So I'm trying to put it to you in the context of, think of it this way, if you're pulling a boat up a hill, friction is hurting you. If you're trying to hold a boat and stop it from sliding down into the lava, friction is helping you. It's stopping the boat from moving. Remember that friction always resists movement. So if you're just trying to keep a boat stationary and stop it from sliding down into you know, the abyss, then friction is, is beneficial, right? It's reducing the amount of work you need to do, the amount of force you need to provide. If, on the other hand, you're trying to pull a boat against friction, you're going to need more force. The T value, the tension, is going to be greater. So in this case, we're going to add those two values. Where you said plus or minus, we're going to add sine theta plus mu cos theta. Now, the only thing is I think some people forgot to multiply by gravity, right? In the too many guys, it's they forgot to take 1200 divide, multiplied by 10. Um, but otherwise, I think everyone did pretty well on this question. That was actually surprisingly well answered, which leads me to think that the too many guys formula was helping many people. Okay, this question. Um, okay, there were a couple of things that most that some people did here wrong. The first thing is a lot of people they wrote out that now keep in mind the second most important thing you need to know in this subject is you need to know that stress equals force over area, right? I don't ask you to remember much. I ask you to remember well. I so ask you to learn heaps of things, but the most important thing you need to remember is that stress equals force over area. But you also need to be able to manipulate that formula. So that in this case. They're not asking for stress, they're asking for force, what force is allowable. And a lot of people didn't re manipulate the formula, right? So I couldn't even give them one mark. If they had rewritten the formula as force equals area times stress, I could have given them one mark. The next thing that people did wrong is that they didn't, um, they didn't identify it was triple shear, right? Some people thought it was double shear. Okay, that'll have to be it for today, but we'll continue on next lesson. Bye, guys. Thank you.